Greetings everyone, my name is Bifear. So if you're watching this video, perhaps a friend sent it to you and told you to watch it. Maybe it's because you were recommended my channel for the first time. Maybe you came here from my massive 4 hour complete story of destiny video and realized that that was way too long for you, or you realized that I have a problem with using all this complex language that isn't exactly explained in that video. Maybe the YouTube algorithm gods delivered you here to these shores. Regardless, Welcome. Hopefully the one thing that most of you have in common is that you want to know more about Destiny. If that's the case, hopefully this series of videos is for you. We're going to be doing these videos about once a week leading up to Witch Queen, and in each episode I wanted to go ahead and talk about the basics behind a specific part of the game's story. At the end of the series, perhaps I'll combine them all into a sort of mega video series that the algorithm seems to love so much. Either way, we'll see. Today, we're going to be covering the absolute basics of the story in Destiny, so that anyone who's totally new can get an idea of what they're initially jumping into. I'm also going to cover a lot of the terminology, definitions, and a few of the events that you're going to see or hear about in Destiny, because honestly, this stuff is going to go over your head otherwise. There's a lot of famous battles that I'm going to go ahead and list too, because yeah, that stuff is all very important to the overall history of things. For some of you veteran players, some of this is going to be pretty self-explanatory, but some of it might not be. Either way, this series is really aimed at completely new players, and people who are thinking of jumping into Destiny want to understand the story behind it, but don't necessarily know all of the language and the unique lexicon that's been built up over seven years. So if you're looking to get an introduction to Destiny, hey, this video is for you. And again, if you are a veteran, there's a chance that you may have missed things. I know plenty of people who are phenomenal PvP and PvE players who just don't know the story and lore behind things and now are starting to feel a little bit, you know, in need of catching up. So regardless of who you are, let's go ahead and talk about the story of Destiny and the basics of the story. So. If you want to understand Destiny, you first need to know about the Light and the Dark. These are two of the primal forces in Destiny's universe, and some sources claim that they existed before the universe or time itself had begun. The Light and Darkness are sources of power, but behind each of them are entities. In the most broad and generally accepted terms, they're commonly seen as the Traveler and the Pyramids. The Traveler is a great sphere that has traveled across the universe for untold billions of years, uplifting civilizations to great technological heights. The Pyramids, which are sometimes referred to as the Black Fleet, is the force of darkness that hunts the Traveler. Commonly, the Traveler will flee from the Black Fleet or any forces of darkness, unfortunately abandoning the uplifted civilizations in its path to their grisly fate. This cycle of the Traveler uplifting a civilization for it only to be destroyed by the darkness has been going on for untold millennia, until eventually the Traveler reached our solar system. After uplifting humanity and after a period of rapid progress known as the Golden Age, the Pyramids once again followed the Traveler to Sol, our solar system. The arrival of the Pyramids began the Collapse, a period where human civilization was cast into ruin and our worlds were broken and burned. This was effectively an apocalypse. Destiny is set in the post-apocalyptic era of this. It appeared that we were once again going through this terrible historical cycle of the darkness pursuing the Traveler and burning whatever civilization it had uplifted to the ground. But this time, instead of fleeing, something different happened. Reports of what actually occurred aren't clear, almost none of them exist in the lore whatsoever, but the most commonly accepted story is that the Traveler sacrificed itself to protect us. There's a few other stories lingering out there about various other parties interfering, looking at Rasputin, which we'll talk about later, but for the moment, forget about all of those, they're not proven. The most commonly accepted story is that the Traveler sacrificed itself in a bid to save us. It defeated the darkness, but in the battle, it also suffered near total damage and was left mostly dead. In its last moments, it released the ghosts. Small autonomous drones with as much personality as people. And the ghosts went out into the solar system and searched for those amongst the long dead that could wield the power of the Traveler's Light. 
Whilst those who rise are known as light bearers generally, almost all of them nowadays make their way to humanity's final bastion, the Last City. And it is here that they take up the mantle and title of Guardian. Guardians can be resurrected by their ghosts infinitely, as long as the ghost is not killed and as long as they still have clear access to the Traveler's Light. But the unique thing about Guardians is that they have no knowledge of their past lives. Some Guardians, who are very lucky, such as Anna Bray, are able to find clues as to who they were before upon their newly returned to life body. You know, it could be something along the lines of a Guardian wakes up and they realize they have a lab coat and an ID badge on. And if that's the case, they know who they were previously. But most Guardians are returned into their second life without any knowledge of who they are or once were. And for reasons that aren't particularly well stated, most Guardians don't tend to go ahead and then pursue information about their past lives. In many instances, it's seen as being better to live this new life because you can't be two people. The indication is that whilst of course you can't retain any of the experiences of your past life, your core personality is retained, and so to an extent, you are mostly the same person. But this is an area of lore and story that's still very unexplored. In Destiny and Destiny 2, you play as one of these Guardians, your own character. Guardians are sorted into three classes, Hunters, Titans, and Warlocks. You're also capable as playing of one of three races, namely Human, Awoken, and Exo. Whilst your choice in race and class is often personal, there are gameplay differences that come along with class choices, and sometimes there are dialogue differences for certain races and for certain classes. Oftentimes these will be small and insignificant and won't have massive impacts on the quests that you do. In fact, I know of almost no difference in class choice that would actually impact the way that a quest ends. Generally speaking though, the world around you will react to the kind of class and race choices that you make and will treat you appropriately. Warlocks, for example, will often be addressed for their wisdom and arcane knowledge, whereas Titans are more often addressed for their martial discipline and brute strength. While interacting with certain areas of the solar system, Exos and Awoken characters in particular will sometimes hear alternate lines of dialogue based on their race. Ultimately, with three character slots, it's common to choose one of each class and one of each race amongst veteran players that run three characters. We'll go into all the classes and races in much more detail in a later video, but for now, here's a brief description that I think should suffice. As far as classes are concerned, all Guardian classes are capable of exceptional combat prowess, and so they are more broadly defined by their general character traits. Titans are often seen as the most martial and disciplined of the three classes. They organize themselves into orders that have often been expressed in purpose, such as the Pilgrim Guard, whose purpose was to guide refugees to the last safe city, or the Stoneborn Order, who defend the city's walls. Titans are tactical, but often brutish, and are known to get up close and personal, charging into combat in some cases literally head first. A famous phrase of a Titan is that, up close, a fist is better than any gun. And commonly, that's what Titan strategies relate to and rely on. Hunters are, in comparison, far less organized and far more independent. Hunters often wander and scout the wilds beyond the city in solitude, but will sometimes form into gangs or posses. Some famous hunter posses, such as the Six Coyotes, contain multiple legendary guardians. Hunters crave not only independence, but adventure, and will commonly embark on exploratory missions across the system, bringing back tales of bounties collected, treasures found, and great monsters slain. Their combat styles are distinctly survivalist, but rely on tried and tested tools to get the job done. Bladed weapons and guns are equally common in a hunter's arsenal, but nothing defines a hunter more than a strong, dependable hunter's knife. Warlocks are concerned, above all, with knowledge. Whilst all Guardians can interact with the light upon their resurrection and use it to channel their greatest powers, Warlocks are the ones able to tap into the most primal of the Traveler's powers. Their power comes not from the fist or the blade, but from the light itself. Where a titan will punch, a warlock will summon a kinetic force in the palm of their hands and repel their foes. Warlocks organize themselves into a variety of orders that tend to embrace philosophical views on the universe. They can vary wildly in practices. 
Some of the wildest amongst them include an order known as the Thanatonauts, literally the explorers of death if you translate that out of Latin. Thanatonauts will search for visions of the future and hidden knowledge in death itself, voluntarily killing themselves and then being rezzed, having been given a glimpse into some potential form of knowledge. You're unlikely to see a warlock using brute force to get their way. Their combat style often relies on anything from shamanistic elements of the world upon which they walk, to ethereal grace gifted by the light of the sun in order to fight against their foes. A warlock can summon an artificial singularity, or knit one's wounds back together with the purest of light. They are often known to pursue knowledge to dangerous ends though, and whilst there are many fabled warlocks, most of them are fabled for views or practices that upset the status quo in some way. As for the three species, humans are as you would expect them to be, albeit there are some significant advancements that were made during the Golden Age. The Traveler uplifted our civilization, and not only enlightened us and made us generally more kind to each other, but also made some pretty significant benefits that we can see much more tangibly. Human beings in this day and age of even the post-apocalyptic era that we live in now, in Destiny's universe are more intelligent and, as a general rule of thumb, have a longer lifespan. The Golden Age and the effects of it are quoted to have tripled the human lifespan, and thus human beings are far more durable than they used to be. But our numbers are dwindling, and our last safe bastion, the last city, is the only place that we can still truly call home outside of a few settlements in the wild. The Awoken and the Exos are both post-human. That is to say that all Awoken and Exos were once humans, but they came into being in a very different manner and are now no longer human, but still carry the same traits that we might all recognize. The Awoken are humans that have been put under the effect of a fusion of light and dark, who came from an artificial singularity created during the collapse of human civilization. Because of the way that time passed in the singularity, the Awoken civilization within was allowed to advance to unprecedented heights and was able to exist in relative peace for millions if not billions of years, whilst in real time outside of the singularity it had been hardly decades or even years. Eventually, the Awoken people were split into two. Some of them stayed in their home in the Singularity, which they call the Distributory. Others were led by Queen Mara Sov and returned into Sol. And when she arrived back in Sol, she founded the Kingdom of the Reef, which is located in the asteroid belt of our system, lying between Jupiter and Mars. The many fleeing ships in the Collapse never made it further than this border, and so many of the hulks and wrecks found in the large asteroids were convenient for starting a new kingdom. They held many resources, and oftentimes could be pillaged for material. When they left their old home, their Queen Mara Sov also noticed that strange powers had begun to manifest in both herself and her people. The exact reason for this strange magic is unknown, but it appears that it is strengthened when the Awoken people are closer to Mara Sov herself, and she is the most gifted user of this power compared to all the others of her people. The Exos are the result of a series of experiments and studies conducted by the Clovis Bray Corporation in the Golden Age. The hope of the Clovis Bray Corporation and of their founder, Clovis Bray, was to create immortal humans who had their consciousnesses transferred into digital exo minds that could live in exo bodies. Essentially, human beings being turned into robots that still had their perfect personalities. The result of these experiments were attained at great cost to many, but the unscrupulous corporation and its founder for which it was named didn't care. The Exos are known for having a number after their names, such as Saint-14, Lakshmi-2, or Banshee-44. This number indicates the number of times that they have been rebooted, an unfortunate necessity as the process of preserving the human mind within an exo isn't all perfect. To cut through a lot of complicated jargon, the human minds at the hearts of the exos all realize that they aren't actually in a human body, and this causes trauma and disassociation. Exos now can be found alongside their human counterparts in the last city, and are a relatively uncommon sight, 
but people wouldn't necessarily question the Exo or see them as some otherworldly oddity. Exos were still seen in the Golden Age after all. The Exos often dream of the deep stone crypt where they were born, but at the heart of every Exo lies a dark and terrible secret that until recently was not known or truly uncovered. As a guardian in destiny, your broad responsibility, regardless of whether you're a hunter, titan, or warlock, fighting as a human, awoken, or exo, is generally going to be to fight back the forces of the darkness that threatened the last city. The forces that we have faced contain many strange and deadly foes, but the broadest defined categories of enemies that you'll be facing are the Fallen, Hive, Cabal, Vex, Taken, and Scorn. I'll go ahead and briefly explain each of these enemy factions in a bit more depth. They'll also have their own episodes in this series, but for now, these are the basics that you absolutely need to know about each of these enemy factions. Let's go ahead and get started with the Fallen. The term Fallen is actually slang created by humanity, a colloquialism that was born out of our first few encounters with this group of six-limbed aliens. More commonly nowadays, it's seen for the slur that it is. Sometimes known as spider pirates before the colloquialization of their name, the true name of their species is the Elixni, and they were the last species that the Traveler blessed with its light. They used to control a multi-system empire of sorts before their equivalent of the Collapse occurred. They refer to this event as the Whirlwind, and whilst most of the fallen houses fell at their homeworld of Reese, some of the noble houses followed the Traveler through the darkness of space and arrived at our solar system after the Collapse. They are a people that has suffered greatly. Once divided into proud and noble houses back on their homeworld, the Elixni are now often little more than thieves or warlords. The fallen houses are now more akin to pirate gangs, and their noble, old ways are remembered by only a few remaining Elixni. The Fallen have an incredible talent for improvising weaponry and using scrap and salvage around them to create their implements of war. Their innate understanding of machinery means that they're often accompanied by mechanical constructs, anything from small shanks, medium-sized servitors, all the way up to massive combat mechs such as brigs or walkers, all of which are internally autonomous and do not need a commander or instructor or a crew inside them to function. The Fallen used to be humanity's most common adversary after the Collapse, but in recent years, relations with some Elixni houses have changed. The House of Light in particular, run by a Elixni known as Mithrax, is dedicated to serving and protecting the Traveler, and now stands with humanity in the Last City. You can find them in the Elixni Quarter if you're playing the game around about the time when this video is being released. In the recent season of The Splicer, we saw the story of them integrating into the city, something monumental in story terms, as it's long been speculated whether humanity might be able to make allies out of the Elixni. They are not all enemies, but should you encounter a Fallen in the wild, expect them to shoot first. Not all houses are allies, and nowadays you can commonly find them in purple garb, flying the banner of the House of Dusk, a generalist house that is made up of the fractured forces of once great and noble houses, which does not have a great degree of structure. Those of you who should venture to Europa will encounter the fallen of the House of Salvation, an Elixni house that has explicitly allied itself and is making use of the darkness and its power. Next, we need to talk about the Hive. The Hive are an ancient force of beings that long ago made a pact with servants of darkness known as the Worm Gods. They were granted immortality and great power, but in exchange for these powers, something else was required of the Hive. Every Hive ingests one of the larvae of the Worm Gods, and that larvae is not consumed, it stays within the Hive, and carnage and destruction must be fed to it, or the Worm will feed on its host. This is the price of their immortality. The destruction and carnage in their wake is required to keep them alive, and they venerate this process. They believe in the philosophy of the darkness, known as the Sword Logic, and they have followed its principles almost without exception for billions of years. 
They have put thousands of species to the torch and committed genocides on a scale beyond reckoning, committing them so regularly that they apparently at one point became routine. The most powerful amongst them, known as their Ascendant Hive, are commonly referred to as gods, and have godlike powers to match. Some of them are even capable of maintaining what is known as a throne world, meaning that if they die, they can be reborn in their own pocket dimension, and can then return to live again. Chief amongst the Ascendant Hive were the three true Hive Gods. They were the original three who made the pact with the Worm Gods. Their names were Oryx, the Great Navigator and Taken King, Savathun, the Witch Queen and God of Deception, and Shivor Rath, the God of War. Six years ago, we killed Oryx the Taken King, and since then, the Hive has been in a state of unrest, with the other two major gods beginning to consolidate power amongst themselves. Savathun in particular is strange, because she has now broken away from the other Hive, her and her brood now stand as a distinctly separate entity from the other hive, and are being actively hunted by Shivu or Rath, the Worm Gods, and other forces of darkness. We will soon face that Lucent Brood in the Witch Queen expansion, which comes along in February, and she represents not only the most intelligent foe that we've ever faced, but potentially the most powerful, having stolen the one thing that we believed the hive would never wish to touch, and that they could never even steal. The power of the light. Next are the Cabal, a militaristic race of aliens hailing from the world of Torobatl. They have an empire that they've built through conquest and slaughter, and their closest human analogue is that of ancient Rome. Indeed, many of the names and practices of the Cabal reflect this. For example, on Toro Battle, they had institutions such as an emperor who ruled over them, and legions that defended them. They take on captive and client species within their empire, and have been known to grind entire worlds to dust beneath their planet-crushing war machines. Each cabal easily dwarfs a human in physical stature, and their military prowess has been ingrained into them for generations. Weighing in at 600 pounds and being easily up to 8 feet tall for smaller versions of the Cabal, they are capable of crushing almost any other species in terms of raw physical power. But as you'll soon understand, oftentimes that's not the only metric with which you measure power. If the Fallen are a Shiv, the Cabal are a Hammer. Unsubtle in their approach to warfare, and not known for diplomacy or grace, the Cabal are often used to fighting wars and winning them through attrition, wherever their legions find themselves. The oddest feature of the Cabal that we see on the battlefield today is probably that of the Scions, a former slave race that's now commonly found serving in the Cabal military as an augmenting force. Scions are smaller in physical stature to the other Cabal, but what they lack for in firepower and raw muscle is made up for in psionic power the powers of the mind, which they can use to dazzling effect on the battlefield. They can lift a guardian into the air with but a simple thought. Some really powerful scions, known as scion flayers, have been even known to pull moons out of their natural orbits to threaten planets with them as weapons. The Cabal in most recent days have become desperate though. After Dominus Gaul, their military dictator failed to secure the light of the Traveler, and his Red Legion were repelled from the last city, the Cabal have been scattered, only to be reunited by Empress Keitel. Keitel's arrival in the system, however, was not a moment of conquest, but of survival. Desperate survival at that. She and her forces fled the Cabal homeworld of Toro Battle with the rest of her people, as Shivur Rath, the Hive God of War, came to claim the Cabal home system. Keitel has come to Sol with the intent of reuniting her forces with the Lost Scout Legions and the Red Legion that they will one day use to retake their home. A tentative armistice currently exists between Keitel's Legion and the Lost City, but she does not yet have full consolidated control over all the Kabul remnants stuck in Sol. Many Red Legion loyalists refuse to flock to her banner, and will still engage us on site. If you see any Cabal, regardless of where they are, assume that they are hostile. Next are the Vex. The Vex are often mistaken as just exceptionally advanced robots, 
but they're actually better described as a gestalt consciousness or hive mind formed from microscopic organisms that just so happen to pilot the brass-framed combat mechs that we engage with. The Vex, to this day, are still somewhat poorly understood in comparison to other alien factions, but we have made key discoveries that have helped us to understand them as time has progressed. As a collective, the Vex are singularly focused on their goal of survival, a goal that has them stretching the limits of possibility by bending space and time to their whims. They wish to be the final victors of the universe, but their adherence to the principle is not done out of faith. It is done out of necessity, and out of a ruthless calculus that has driven them to convert entire planets into calculating and thinking machines. Mercury, Venus, Mars, and numerous other planetoids throughout the system, such as Nessus and Io, have all been infected by the Vex. The true Vex, the white mind fluid within the robots that still holds millions of microscopic organisms making them up, is dangerous to the extreme, and if ingested or even just touched, has a chance of converting whatever it comes into contact to into more Vex material. This has happened to a few Guardians, and the process has left them with either complete conversion into a Vex as their fate, or with Vex limbs that twitch and move partly outside of the user's control. The Vex have one singular goal of survival, but there are many subdivisions within the Gestalt intelligence of the Vex. These different divisions of Vex are often referred to as subtypes, and will often explore different avenues to accomplish the same goal. For example, the Hazen Protective and Hazen Corrective on Venus focused on the manipulation of timelines within the Vault of Glass and protect the great constructs of the Vault and the Citadel. The Vex on Mercury, located within the Infinite Forest beneath its surface, use massive simulation engines to predict future timelines in which the Vex have defeated all other forces and then work to enact those timelines at the cost of all others. Most terrible amongst them all, however, are the forces of the Sol Divisive, the Vex of the Black Garden, the birthplace of the Vex, which came into contact with the terrible power of the darkness and have bound themselves to it with acts of worship, seeing that their best chance of survival comes from their subservience to a power far beyond their own. Most other Vex submines, strangely enough, seem to avoid these Vex, indicating that the united gestalt intelligence of the Vex isn't as complete as it might seem, and that fracturing subtypes and submines maybe have more individuality than one might initially suspect, even if they are incapable of emotions and mostly recognize only the patterns of survival. Most Vex units aren't initially designed with combat in mind, but any Vex frame is capable of responding to a combat situation that may arise, and they are all armed with extremely powerful energy weapons and commonly have teleportation technology. The most dangerous amongst them are giant hulking frames that can either float or march across the battlefield and are capable of laying waste to supposedly superior forces in terms of numbers. They are tough, and slow outside of their teleportation, and oftentimes will be able to defeat enemies with superior firepower. Next we have the Taken. The Taken were first witnessed in the solar system when one of the three Hive Gods, Oryx the Taken King, arrived, and began to use his powers learned explicitly from the darkness to abduct and corrupt the other forces in Sol. Taken are dark, corrupted versions of other enemy races, including the Fallen, Hive, Cabal, and Vex. Their creation is subject to much speculation, but at current, the best guess is that they are abducted through a portal and stand before the darkness itself. When they stand before it, they are corrupted and empowered by it, sent back as both hollow shells of what they once were and empowered greater versions of themselves, without any free will and only a desire to serve their master, whoever that may be. This process not only robs them of free will, but also ties them into the greater command structure of the Taken, which originally was commanded by Oryx the Taken King, although now that he is dead, it is understood that the segmentation within the command structure can go a little bit deeper. Instead of having a single overriding will, the will is still passed down, with Greater Taken taking on a command role if they are able to organize. However, the Taken will still generally be animalistic without a greater mind controlling them. 
and with a greater mind commanding them, they will be able to have stunning effectiveness on the battlefield. Taken forces can materialize out of nowhere and are known to augment the combat abilities of any abducted forces within their ranks. For example, a Cabal Phalanx, when taken, will have its shield converted into a propulsion weapon which will allow enemy combatants to be pushed away, potentially into hazardous objects or off of cliffs. Taken forces are commonly seen fighting alongside the Hive, and at current are commanded by Shivu Araf, the Hive God of War. This development was extremely recent, as prior to this, they were commanded by Savathun, the Witch Queen, who took control of them after the death of Oryx. During his reign as the supreme ruler of the Hive, Oryx used the Taken as his greatest weapon, and the right by which he would conquer thousands of civilizations. They are always extremely dangerous, and will engage Guardian targets immediately, being drawn by their ravenous hunger to the Guardian's light. Last, but certainly not least, are the Scorn, which are some of the strangest and latest forces to emerge in Sol. They are, in essence, corrupted and undead fallen. They were born thanks to the magic of Riven, the last of the Wish Dragons. Yes, Destiny has dragons, we'll talk more about them in a bit. Riven granted the wish of the Awoken Prince of the Reef, Aldrin Solv, who wished for a dying fallen Archon to survive. The Archon was known as Fikral, and he was then given immortality by Riven. Whenever he died, he would rise again, and he was also given the power to resurrect other fallen, and so remake them into Scorn. Thus, the Scorn as a race were born, and they have been a menace across the tangled shore of the reef, as well as its dreaming city, the Awoken's home outside of the distributary, for a long time now. They are aggressive and savage, attacking Guardians, Awoken, and almost anything else on sight. Recently, the Scorn have begun to coordinate with the forces of the Hive and the Taken, leading to suspicions that they have aligned themselves to the darkness, or have perhaps become subservient to it. The Scorn, shortly after their creation, were also responsible, in combination with Aldrin Sov, for the death of one of the most important characters in Destiny's story, Cade Six. The murder of Cade caused us to hunt them along the Tangled Shore, and to venture into the Dreaming City to kill Riven, their creator. It also led us on the path to killing Aldrin Sov, who was commanding them. This brought about staggering consequences for the world of Destiny, as Aldrin's body was then found by a ghost, and he was resurrected into a guardian that we now know as Crow. Aldrin Sov is an important character, and Crow not remembering who he was in his previous life, as Aldrin Sov, is now having a huge impact on Destiny's story. He still does not quite understand that he created the Scorn. He simply knows that there have been strange interactions where they have occasionally called him Father and betrayer within the same breath. All of these enemies pose a terrible threat, but humanity has many great heroes and leaders amongst the Guardians who will stand against them. Here are a few of the more important ones that you might need to know about. Firstly, Commander Zavala, the Titan Vanguard Mentor. He is effectively the leader of the city at this moment in time alongside Ikora, and he is the leading member of the Vanguard. The Vanguard is a council of three guardians, commonly one representing each class, that act as the city's leaders, but individually, each Vanguard member is a mentor to other guardians that arrive in the city of that same class, and they will coordinate with guardian forces at large. Zavala is the city's greatest general at current, and is responsible for all military operations planned beyond the reach of the city's walls. Ikora Ray is the Warlock Vanguard mentor. She is responsible for internal affairs, but is also the leader of an organization known as the Hidden. Think of them as the last city's equivalent of the FBI, NSA, and CIA all rolled into one. She is a fearsome warlock who studied as the apprentice of the fabled warlock Osiris, and who is renowned for her mastery of void light. A powerful combatant, but also a shrewd negotiator. She has taken on many assignments and many roles, and one would be foolish to underestimate her combat prowess. Saint-14 was lost in the darkness of the Infinite Forest on Mercury after he went searching for the exiled warlock Osiris, who also happened to be his lover. He was lost within the forest's depths and was killed by the Vex there, 
who worked specifically to drain his light by creating a single Vex mind with all their resources that would be able to kill him and him specifically by draining his light. He therefore could not be resurrected. When Osiris returned from exile, he worked at great cost to try and bring Saint-14 back, and it was only with our help that he succeeded. Saint-14 now oversees the trials of Osiris, but is also a common face for Guardians in the last few years as he has become more and more involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the Tower. His exploits and accolades leave some to name him the greatest Titan who ever lived. The great warlock Osiris was exiled by the Speaker, the former leader of the city and the Guardians, but was then rediscovered as Guardians explored the infinite forest on Mercury. He is a warlock of unique and terrifying power, and was at one time probably the most powerful guardian in history. His unique abilities included the power to convert himself into a multitude of copies of himself, each of them able to fight and battle just as he could. These reflections of his could be used to spread information, to sacrifice themselves so others could be saved, and even to fight with the same light that Osiris himself possessed. Osiris was terrified, however, that there was a greater threat than him, a threat that was posed by the Vex, and he gladly accepted his exile so that he could go and fight them in their own realm. His return to the Tower allowed him to engage more in the war that the Guardians were continuing to fight in the more recent years. His story, however, has taken a turn for the worst with the death of his ghost, Sagira, leaving him without the light. As we have just discovered, Savathun, the Hive God of Deceit, used the opportunity of Sagira's death to inhabit his body, and unknown to all of us, watched alongside us and helped us in our plans for almost a whole year before revealing herself. Osiris's current whereabouts are unknown, as the true Osiris has been held captive by Savathun. Although, if the Witch Queen's bargain is to be upheld, Savathun has promised to return him to us, when we conduct a bargain with her that is currently undergoing the process of being completed in the Season of the Lost. Whether this will occur or not is still to be seen. Crow is a guardian we've touched on earlier in this video, but his impact on the tower goes beyond his past life as Aldrin Sov, Prince of the Reef, and brother to the Queen of the Reef, Mara Sov. If the old Hunter ways are to be honoured, Crow may one day take up the mantle of Hunter Vanguard Mentor, given that Cade Six, the man he murdered, wished that his killer should replace him as part of what is known as the Hunter Dare, a bet that has to be honoured if it is fulfilled, a bet that every Hunter will honour, by right of tradition and by Hunter's honour. Crow has yet to take his place in this position, as it's not clear that everyone would accept him. Aldrin Sov is still a much hated figure within the ranks of the Guardians, having murdered one of the people's heroes in the form of Cade. Crow still has much to learn as a Guardian generally, but his power is already impressive for a relatively young Guardian, and it is seen that a great destiny may yet await him. Lord Saladin was at one point the last of the Iron Lords. Before the Guardians existed, the Iron Lords were humanity's greatest protectors. They were also Lightbearers, and they fought for justice in the time of the Dark Ages before the city had been founded. When Guardians didn't truly exist yet, they stood as the bulwark of humanity and as warriors that generally fought for justice. Other Lightbearers, known as Warlords, were known in this time to use their powers for evil means, and the Iron Lords resisted and often turned these Warlords to their side eventually. It was this action that earned them the titles of some of humanity's greatest heroes. However, all of them died with an interaction with ancient Golden Age technology, leaving Lord Saladin as the last to remain who would still take up the mantle of Iron Lord. One other survived, known as Lady Ephrodite, but she is now a pacifist and exists in a strange pacifist guardian colony far out at the edges of the system. Today, Lord Saladin helps to run the Tournament of the Iron Banner to test the strength and light of those Guardians who serve to fight humanity. Lord Shax is the Crucible Handler. Long since the beginning of the city, the Crucible refers to the action and arena in which Guardians would fight against each other. Today, 
The Crucible is a formal institution with matches overseen by Lord Shax. Shax sees this as a vital part of the battle to ensure that the city survives, as the Crucible is a safe venue for Guardians to train and hone their skills in live fire exercises against other deadly opponents. Shax has rarely stepped into the politics of the city, but in his past, he was one of the city's greatest heroes at one of its greatest battles, the Battle of the Twilight Gap. It is here that he held the line along with his other five fire team members and quite probably saved the last city from complete destruction at the hands of not one, but three fallen houses. Eris Morn, the last, is a hunter who took part in an assault on the Hive's lunar fortress known as the Hellmouth. The other five members of her fire team perished, but she survived and was forever scarred by the event having to steal back her sight by stealing the eyes of a Hive Acolyte. Eris's fire team, in their attempt to kill the son of the Taken King Oryx known as Crota the Light Eater, was completely annihilated. They failed in their attempt, and Crota still lived. But as the Hive God was beginning to be summoned back, Eris returned to us. She had existed in the Hellmouth for hundreds of years, and yet she escaped, coming to warn us of Crota's impending threat. Crota and Oryx both died at our hands, and now Eris fights against the forces of the Hive and has proven to be a dependable and trustworthy ally in our quest to understand the darkness and the Hive more. She has also come to wield the powers of the darkness, understanding that there is more to it than the evil it is so commonly associated with. The Drifter is one of the most lawless figures in the entire city, if not the entire system. His presence is tolerated by the Vanguard, but he is taboo to state the least. He runs his own game known as Gambit, an exercise involving Taken gifted to him by the mysterious organization known as the Nine, whose current alignment and preferences are still somewhat poorly understood. The Drifter was a key member of the Tower's apparatus that helped Guardians understand that the universe had more shades of grey than might have initially been suspected. Whilst he is a light bearer, the Drifter is not a Guardian, and technically goes beyond any formal classification as such. He has been known to steal and lie and cheat, but has also proven to be a key ally in some of the theatres of war involving the fight against the darkness, and has also learned to, as he would put it, embrace the dark a lot more closely than others. Before we explain our last hero, I think it's worth explaining the rather pivotal change that has happened in Destiny in the last year, one that I think you will now see as rather obvious from the last two characters we spoke about. I've spoken a great deal about the light and darkness, but the reality is not as simple as black and white morality. The light and darkness are indeed entities, each of which can be aligned to either good or evil from our perspective. But the light and darkness are both also sources of power, and behind each of those sources of power, there are those who are willing and capable of wielding them. Guardians, as it turns out, can tap into the powers of both light and darkness, and that is exactly what happened on Europa in the Beyond Light expansion, which is where we met one of Destiny's most mysterious and infamous characters. Formerly known only by myth and legend, the Exo Stranger is actually a time-traveling Exo who has seen the darkness win in countless timelines in great battles. Her real name is Elsie Bray, one of the four grandchildren of the original creator of the Exos, known as Clovis Bray. She wields the power of the darkness and the element of stasis, and has proven it to be a powerful force in the hands of Guardians, it has also proven that whilst its corruption is a danger, it is not inherent. She has helped us to unlock the secrets of our first ever Darkness subclass, and this is why we learned to wield Stasis. She has become a vital ally on the European front, and she has changed the way that we see the universe and its most primal forces forever. First met by us seven years ago at this point, she is one of the more poorly understood characters in Destiny always seeming to lack time to explain, and then, when asked why, she says that she doesn't even have time to explain why she doesn't have time to explain. 
Yeah, for you Destiny veterans, I had to mention that line. Those of you that enter the universe of Destiny today, enter it at a time of great change. The darkness and light have risen again. The pyramids have returned and the Traveler has reformed and is once again alive. The great conflict that once occurred during the collapse is beginning to brew again. And within the next few years, the final cataclysmic battle between the light and the dark is set to begin. You as a guardian will be the key unknown in this fight. Your choices and your powers are likely to determine the balance of the universe and the fate of all life both here and yet to be. I also want to prepare you by touching on some commonly used terminology, which is commonly found in game but is not always understood. The list is going to be a little long, so forgive me, but I promise it's really useful to know these words and terms. So yeah, let's take a listen. First of all, paracausal. Probably one of the most commonly used, commonly misunderstood, and most important terms in all of Destiny. I could go on a whole video rant about what paracausality is, but when someone uses this word, it's basically someone that goes beyond the laws of causation. In Destiny terms, paracausal power is basically space magic, the same space magic wielded by the Guardians, the Traveler, the Pyramids, the Hive Gods, and various other characters throughout the setting. The powers of the Awoken are paracausal. The powers of the Ascendant Hive are paracausal. The powers of any Lightbearer are paracausal. Paracausal power effectively means that you can use space magic to break the laws of the universe, thus allowing impossible things to happen. Hunters might use this, for example, to summon a gun wreathed in flame that is able to deal immense damage. Warlocks might use it to throw a singularity on a micro scale towards their enemies that will then detonate outwards and destroy them with incredible forces. Titans might use it to channel the light beneath them into a great attack that will then discharge electric arc damage in a great radius. These are things such as our supers or our grenades or the powers attached to them. Whilst the word paracausal can commonly simply be interpreted as space magic, there is a lot of nuance to it and it is far grander than I could possibly explain in a single video like this. Next, sword logic and bomb logic. These are basically two competing ideologies, one of the darkness and one of the light. The sword logic applies to the darkness and values simplicity, brutality, and murder. In the view of the sword logic, to kill is to gain power, and those that are the most powerful hone themselves by becoming better killers. The practice of the sword logic will one day, according to the hive and the darkness, lead towards the perfect final shape as the darkness decrees it. Power arises in the sword logic from simplicity and the ability to kill and keep on living. When someone kills and the sword logic is invoked in that action, they are taking and not having power given to them. And more importantly than that, as they take the power and kill those who they are stronger than, they will literally become more powerful. Effectively, this is a form of social Darwinism on a scale of galactic proportions that is capable of wiping out entire species. The Hive are the perfect embodiment of it. Almost perfect, at least. The bomb logic, conversely, is the ideology of the Traveler and the Light, which values power born of complexity. Whilst a sword is a single part, a bomb is made of many parts. Innate, if they are fought individually, but if put together, they are far more powerful than the sword. It is through such complexity that it is seen that life is capable of arising, and the bomb logic, therefore, is often seen as a more complicated game than the sword logic, but it still has proven to be powerful, and allows life to flourish and develop in interesting ways without much consequence, in complete contradiction to the sword logic. Next, the Ascendant Plane. The Ascendant Plane is like the backstage of the universe. If you've seen Stranger Things, think of this as Destiny's version of the Upside Down. Paracausal beings, like Guardians, are much more powerful in the Ascendant Plane because it's within the Ascendant Plane that causality molds much more easily to consciousness. In other words, you are capable of creating things with your space magic here. Some paracausal beings can even use their power to create their own pocket universes called throne worlds. 
We mentioned prominently that most Hive gods have throne worlds and are able to do this. Ahamkara. The Ahamkara, or Wish Dragons, are just that. Dragons with paracausal powers known more commonly as Wish Magic. The wishes granted by the Wish Dragons are commonly seen as either Faustian bargains or wishes which come as a sort of monkey's paw. The wish is often granted, but at the cost that makes it not worth having asked for in the first place, or in a way that is commonly manipulated. The creation of the fanatic, Fikral, by Aldrin Sov, who wished for him to live, is a perfect example. Aldrin wished for the fanatic to live, and ultimately created something undead. Aldrin's fanatic still lives on, but will never die. The Ahamkara, as at the end of Forsaken, are now probably extinct, as we killed the last of them, riven of a thousand voices. Ark, Solar, Void, and Stasis. These are currently the four elements in Destiny. The first three of these elements are commonly attributed to the power of the light. Stasis, on the other hand, is commonly attributed with darkness. Rasputin. Rasputin is another character in Destiny. To put it really simply, he is an incredibly powerful sentient AI. In Destiny, he is called a Warmind. He was once humanity's greatest protector, but who has now fallen twice to the power of the darkness. The Books of Sorrow. These are some of the oldest records of Destiny's lore, and contain the history of the Hive's civilization going back billions of years. It also contains the story of how they came to worship the darkness, made their pact with the Worm Gods, and came to become the arbiters of the sword logic. The Grimoire When someone in Destiny's community talks about the Grimoire, they're commonly referring to Grimoire cards back in Destiny 1, which at one point in time was the game's only source of lore and oftentimes was seen as one of the game's better sources of storytelling. The Nine The Nine are a series of consciousnesses born of dark matter. Our presence within the universe creates an imprint on the dark matter which gives them form and shape. Without this, they would cease to be, and therefore they have a vested interest in our survival. They have in recent years created entities such as Zur and the Emissary of the Nine to reach out and communicate with us. They are one of the most mysterious and poorly understood forces in all of Destiny. Different Time Periods Destiny's timeline, at least for humanity, can be broken up into the pre-Golden Age era, aka the 21st century, the Golden Age when the Traveler uplifted us, the Collapse when the Darkness arrived, the Dark Age which was right after the Collapse, the city age when the last city truly began to establish itself, and the contemporary time period of the Destiny games. The Distributary The Distributary was the original birthplace of the Awoken, found within a singularity artificially formed by the light and the darkness during the Collapse. This is a separate place from the Kingdom of the Reef as we know it today, and is one of the Awoken's most closely guarded secrets. Radiolaria Radiolaria are the microscopic organisms that are commonly referred to as the true Vex. Radiolaria and Vex mind fluid are often referred to interchangeably. The parlance of destiny sometimes refers to this stuff as Vex milk on account of its appearance as a white viscous liquid. The Consensus The Consensus represented the overall government of humanity's last city. When fully functional, it featured the three vanguard mentors, the three faction leaders, and the Speaker to lead it. In Destiny's recent history, the Speaker and Hunter Vanguard mentor have died, and the factions have been dissolved on account of a failed coup. The Consensus functionally no longer exists. The Factions The Tower used to commonly maintain factions, and these were representatives of opinions within the civilian population of the last city. Factions have risen and fallen in power as time has gone on, but the three that were around when they were eventually dissolved included New Monarchy, Dead Orbit, and Future War Cult. New Monarchy was dedicated to improving the city, but also wished to one day establish a dictatorship with a single supreme philosopher king at its center. 
The future war cult were obsessed constantly with war on the horizon and were preparing consistently for any eventuality which would bring conflict. Their leader, Lakshmi II, was the one who initiated the failed coup. Dead Orbit believed that humanity needed to survive by fleeing Sol. They have amassed a massive fleet, and use it sparingly to recover other vessels to add to that fleet. The end goal is to see humanity make a great leap into space as part of a massive diaspora, and in the process, save their species by leaving behind their ruined worlds and finding a new place for humanity amongst the stars. Siva. Siva is a nanite technology created by the Clovis Bray Corporation. It could be directed by whichever mind controlled it to create and destroy, and was unfortunately weaponized by Rasputin to destroy the Iron Lords near the end of the Dark Age. The Iron Lords. Guardians before there were guardians, the Iron Lords were an order of old heraldic light bearers that valued honor, duty, and sacrifice. They were humanity's greatest warriors and protectors in the point of the Dark Age, and their ranks contained many famous guardians, such as Lord Saladin, Lady Ephrodite, Felwinter, Radagast, Scori, Gelion, and more. I think it would be also useful to help arm you with some knowledge of the famous events in Destiny's history. There are a ton of wars and battles and things that have happened, so hopefully this will help to keep you on top of all of that. This isn't everything, but these are probably the most important of the events. The Battle of the Six Fronts This was the first major attack on the last city by a fallen house called the House of Devils. The battle is named as such because in this battle the Titans defended the city with four forces split across six fronts. Not a single one of those six fronts fell. The Titans use a representation of this battle as their class sigil to this day. The Battle of the Twilight Gap This is unquestionably the most famous battle and defense of the last city in the city's history. It involved an assault by three fallen houses on the last city, namely the House of Devils, the House of Kings, and the House of Winter, which all attacked the city and were it not for Lord Shax's fire team and their heroic action holding at the location of Twilight Gap, the city would certainly have fallen. The Reef Wars Occurring in the same time period as the Battle of the Twilight Gap and occurring within the territory of the Reef, around the Asteroid Belt, the Reef Wars were a series of skirmishes and assaults that played out between the Awoken of the Reef and the Fallen of the House of Wolves that was headed to join the other three houses at the Battle of the Twilight Gap. The Queen of the Reef, Mara Sov, intervened here and by doing so almost certainly saved the last city from doom. The Great Disaster the Great Disaster references the largest Guardian army ever gathered in history and their assault on the moon. An army of over a thousand Guardians was gathered on the moon and assaulted the Hive en masse. The Hive god Crota, son of Oryx, the Light Eater, blunted the assault and slew Guardians by the dozens, if not the hundreds, crushing the army and forcing them to retreat. After this, the consensus declared that no further Guardian operations were to be conducted on the moon. This was unquestionably the greatest defeat in the city's history. The Crusades of Saint-14 These Crusades were a series of offensive actions that took place after the Battle of the Twilight Gap, where Saint-14 attacked and devastated the fallen houses in retribution for the attack on the last city. The Great Hunt The Great Hunt occurred when the Ahamkara began to rewrite the surface of Venus, Guardians saw this rewriting of Venus's surface as a massive attack on the planet, as it appeared that the Ahamkara were beginning to burn it to the ground. Guardian leadership resolved to wipe out the Ahamkara who were assaulting the planet, and thus hunted and killed all but one of the Wish Dragons. The Faction Wars In the earliest days of the city's founding, the Faction Wars nearly engulfed the city, until the Guardians united to end the conflict so that the city could be defended from other attackers. This led to the creation of the faction system and the consensus. The Taken War The Taken War was a series of conflicts fought between the Guardians, the Awoken, Humanity, 
and the forces of the Hive of Oryx, the Taken King. This culminated in Oryx's death aboard his dreadnought in the rings of Saturn. The Siva Crisis When Siva nanites were unleashed on Earth by the remnants of the House of Devils, the ensuing crisis was overseen by Lord Saladin. This saw us take on the forces of the Devil Splicers, cyborg fallen augmented with Siva and turned into mechanical constructs of terrible power. The Red War The Red War was the only conflict that ever saw the last city fall. Dominus Gaul, the former leader of the Cabal, conquered the city by caging the Traveler and preventing its light from reaching the Guardians, effectively making them mortal and leaving their ghosts without the ability to provide them with their usual powers. The Red War ended after we reclaimed the light, liberating the city and killing Dominus Gaul, forcing his troops, the Red Legion, and the Cabal fleets to flee into the wilds of Earth. The Curse of the Dreaming City The Dreaming City is what is better seen as the true homeland of the Reefborn Awoken. Whilst there are many outposts within the asteroid belt, the Dreaming City itself is a hidden bastion, which stores a great deal of terrible knowledge and exceptionally powerful Awoken secrets. This was also a place within which the Ahamkara gathered, and is a place we can visit in Destiny now. The curse on the Dreaming City was initiated when Guardians slew the last Ahamkara, Riven of a Thousand Voices. The Curse on the Dreaming City is a three-week cycle that puts the city in a growing state of corruption by Taken Essence, and magic as time progresses. The cycle resets itself eventually, but the wish which enabled this to happen was that of the Witch Queen Savathun. The true purpose of the Curse on the Dreaming City beyond simply weakening the Awoken is as of yet unknown. Hopefully all of that has provided you with more than a substantial introduction. Next, we're going to be talking about individual topics one by one, starting with humanity in the Golden Age, working our way through the various races of humanity, then going back through all the different classes that you can play as a guardian, then working through all the different enemies in Destiny, and then we'll be covering individual topics that I think are important. Hopefully, this Destiny 101 slash Destiny Basics series is gonna help all of you get to grips with the story of Destiny, and will help you all understand it better when you play. If you enjoyed the video or found it at all helpful, go ahead and leave a like. Hopefully this is something that you can go ahead and forward to more people. Destiny can be a complicated game, and it doesn't help that there's been eight years worth of story that oftentimes is explained in a rather poor manner. But hopefully this video series is going to help you get the most out of Destiny as a universe, because genuinely, the story of Destiny is at current the best it's ever been, and I think that now is a fantastic time to jump in. One last thing, if you're at all intimidated by Destiny and its story, I would simply encourage you to try it. And the reason I say that is because whilst I have just spent an hour talking about the story and giving you what I think are the basics as a pure overview, Destiny now is in a place where, as far as the story is concerned, you can jump in with relatively little effort. Destiny is currently free to play, so you can try the gameplay out for yourself without actually having to jump into the game and purchase any of the expansions. If you do purchase the expansions, they have their own standalone story campaigns that have big swings within Destiny's overall narrative arcs, but there's also annual seasonal content for you to jump into. If you jump in in this day and age now, you can also play a lot of the content that was released during the seasons of this last year, and that includes things such as the Strike that was released in the Season of the Chosen, Battlegrounds, the various content released in the Season of the Splicer, the Wrathborn Hunts that you can find in the Season of the Hunt, and you can experience the current seasonal story, which is very important to understand, because effectively, the Season of the Lost is the story that acts as a prelude to Witch Queen. If you want to jump into Destiny and try it, now is a perfect time. And hopefully with all of this knowledge, I've prepared you more than adequately enough. If you want to know more, and if you want more on the basics of Destiny, I'm going to go ahead and explain it all in simple terms, just like this, over more videos as time goes on. But in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Wow, this ended up being really long. Hopefully it was useful. In the meantime, know that, as per usual, your viewership is quite enough for me, and that my name has been My Name is Bife.
Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.